Good afternoon, everyone. Hello and welcome very much to this episode of the Signum Symposia series. This is a series of events in which I or other members of the faculty and staff at Signum talk to special guests, faculty members, students, recent graduates about their theses and so forth. Um, so today I welcome you to this faculty chat with John Garth. So John, as soon as you are able, if you want to put your webcam back on, I'm going to talk about Signum for a minute and make some announcements, and then we will begin. <clears throat> so welcome, everyone. Uh, this is part of one of Signum University's many initiatives to bring learning to a wide audience. So here within the graduate school, we want to share events that have to do especially with language and literature and to share those to a wider public. So welcome very much. I want to remind you that if you like this series, you can donate to Signum University to help keep this, this series and other events going, including things like the Mythgard Academy classes, the Mythgard Movie Club, and our live regional conferences and events that we have. So if you would please consider going to signumuniversity.org and then donate. We would love for you to give a small donation to these events. I want to tell you about the two most notable upcoming events that Signum University has going on that are live. Of course, you can check out the many events that we have online, but we have one of our regional conferences and then our big national conference coming up. So the regional one is TexMoot in Fort Worth, Texas on Saturday, January 13th. And registration is only open for another two weeks. So please hurry and register if you are anywhere near Texas or want to travel here. As a matter of fact, as of right now, about half of our people who are planning to attend are not local, but they're traveling to this conference. The theme is Stories for the Refreshment of the Spirit. And we're looking at language and literature and recovery from trauma or other kinds of healing for either individuals or cultures. So it should be an important and exciting event. And then coming up in June, we have our big national conference, MythMoot. This is the fifth time we have had this. And this will be in Virginia, June 21st through 24th. And registration and the call for papers are now open. So check those out. And our special guest today, John, will be one of the keynote speakers. So those are some of the main events we have. You can check out others on the website. So I will introduce uh, myself and our guest, and then we'll begin. And let me just remind all of you attendees, please type in your questions for John as we go forward, and I can read those out. All right, so I'm Serena Higgins. I'm the chair of the Language and Literature Department here in the Graduate School at Signum University. And our special guest, John Garth, is internationally recognized for his groundbreaking work on the creative development of J.R.R. Tolkien in the context of his times. He's the author of the Mythopoeic award-winning book, Tolkien and the Great War, 2003, and Tolkien at Exeter College, 2014. He's working on a major new book, Tolkien's Mirror, begun during a year as a fellow of the Black Mountain Institute. In 2017, he was presented with the Tolkien Society of Great Britain's Outstanding Contribution Award. So welcome very much, John. We're very glad to have you here. Thank you, Serena. Good to meet you. Good to see you. Very good to see you again, since I haven't talked to you since uh, you taught your class on Tolkien and the Great War for us. So we're glad to have you back. So I want to give a kind of um, overview of maybe how you got into Tolkien, your major interests, and then we'll talk mostly about your recent work, because the point of this series is really to find out what do you do when you're not working for Signum? What is, what is your own independent research? So uh, why don't you start out by telling us how you got interested in Tolkien and sort of what your Tolkien career path has been? Well, it's been rather slow and indirect. Um, it, it started out reading Lord of the Rings when I was nine, um, which is unhealthily early um, and obviously <laughs> had, a, had a huge impact on me that never quite went away. Um, and uh, I just loved it. I've been kind of prepped for that by other stories, by, by Narnia, by Alan Garner's stories, which I do recommend if you don't know uh, Alan Garner. Um, so I, I knew uh, that w when I saw this book, The Lord of the Rings, on my, my mother's shelf, this, this was something that was probably for me because it had maps in it, it had these extraordinary names, it had mysterious inscriptions and so on. Um, and then one evening I just picked it up in a fit of boredom and couldn't put it down. Uh, and I read it probably four times over the next few years so that 
after the first one, which I'm sure I didn't really understand very much of, I started to get the hang of it. Um, now, a, an ongoing thread for me um, is very nerdy. And then another one is very, uh, very unnerdy. Um, so the, the nerdy one is simply that I, I was all, all, always uh, captivated by Tolkien's invented languages. Mm -hmm. And to start to decipher them, to, to understand that uh, Ered meant mountains and Orod meant mountain, and what kind of relationship did that mean between singular and plural? Uh, this taught me an awful lot about language. Um, and it was a, a fascination that, that kept me going, um, going back to Tolkien again and again and again. And I tried to, I learned to type, typing up all the Elvish vocabulary. Now, the non-nerdy side of this is simply that I passionately loved Middle Earth um, to the point when, I suppose, as a 11 year old, could almost convince myself that hobbits must exist because it was just so convincing, you know, surely I'd see one, right? Um, but time went by and other interests supervened. Um, I became um, a student at Oxford University and I was first inspired to go there, of course, by the fact that Tolkien had gone there. But by the time I got there, um, I suppose my my interest to diversify, thankfully, because there was, of course, no Tolkien on the English syllabus that I studied there. Um, it, was a, it was a classic Oxford English syllabus, which took us from um, Old English. So there, my, I had a real advantage over my fellow students that here was something I had already gained a taste for, and it was great to actually get into it. Um, I think you've had that experience recently, Serena, haven't you? Um, and uh, then on the, uh, the other extreme, we had T.S. Eliot and the, the, the modernists and, uh, you know, people that the, the, the literary establishment uh, will validate um, such people uh, and assume, therefore, that Tolkien is invalid, anything that is non-modernist, anything that is, uh, um, as they would call it, escapist. Um, during this, I kept getting the, it was like the Tolkien Annual. It came out every year and it was the new volume of the History of Middle Earth edited by Christopher Tolkien. So the History of Middle Earth uh, is 12 books in which the process of the invention of Middle Earth is mapped out uh, in great detail with um, text that he never finished or text that he did finish but he wanted to improve upon all things that were never published in his lifetime so essentially you're reading Tolkien's manuscripts and typescripts and you get a real sense of the evolution of, of, of the mythology um, so my English university learning didn't quite manage to shake my interest in Tolkien. There was always this lifeline. And when the History of Middle Earth uh, publication process was complete, it was 1996, um, I felt really rather bereaved. Um, and I started to uh, go back to my original thing of doing an Elvish dictionary, right? By this time I was what? Um, 30. <clears throat> But the history of Middle Earth had revealed that this was a really impossible um, pursuit because Tolkien kept tinkering, niggling, as he would have put it, with his invented languages. Um, so if you wanted to create a, a dictionary, you had to kind of do a stratified one that shows the state of the language at various times. And to do that, and this is where it actually started to get interesting, you needed to figure out very precisely the order in which he wrote different things. Now the, excuse me, this is a compendium of, of the first uh, five books in the history of Middle Earth. And uh, <clears throat> there's an awful lot there, as I said, it's extraordinarily detailed. But in fact, it is possible to uh, make further analysis of the order in which things were written. And that's been an ongoing process for me and it's taught me an awful lot. Um, about Tolkien's life, about his motivations, um, because once you understand 
when he wrote something, you can start to look at what was going on in his life, uh, what was going on in the world around him. And those two things are points which Christopher Tolkien assiduously avoids ta talking about in those books. He very strictly uh, presents a history of the texts and texts and their interrelationships. Um, <clears throat> but that leaves a wonderful uh, detective trail for someone with my kind of interests in, in biography and history. Um, and uh, it's still something that I, that I, that I'm working on uh, in, in great detail is, is the chronology of composition and I'm still making discoveries. Um, so, so, uh, That's so exciting. currently, <laughs> currently uh, you know, I've, I've discovered, I've, I've discovered some, some really interesting dates, uh, one of which I, I certainly talk about, um, but there's something else that I've discovered, which overturns a whole set of assumptions about the beginnings of Tolkien's mythology. Um, and I, I'll have to leave that one as a teaser. Right, perfect. Well, as our students know, as, as they learn in their research methods class and in their thesis process, one of the difficult challenges for a young scholar is to find that gap, to find, all right, here's this enormous body of what's been done, but here's what hasn't been done. And it sounds like you have a really good balance of um, two sort of different but important types of scholarship. One is the very close detail the shift, sifting through manuscripts and materials to find this one date, to find out was this written first or second, but the other is the big picture, what's going on in history, what's going on in his life, what are sort of these large cultural movements that are going on across England and across, across Europe. Um, do you find it challenging to unite the minuscule and the cultural, or is that sort of obvious once you, once you see the details where, where they fit? Honestly. It's, it's obvious if you know where I came from with this, because there, there's another strand here, which, which I suppose also probably goes back to the Lord of the Rings, which was an interest in genealogy okay. and family history. So I, I did in, in my 20s, I used to do this as a hobby. I used to, to go in, uh, into uh, archives in, in London and dig around trying to trace my family, who, who were all people living in or so it seemed to me, in, in fairly straightened circumstances in an industrial city of Leeds in the 19th century. They weren't people who left lots of uh, personal records, if any. Um, so it really was a, a, a meticulous and um, taxing uh, search for, for information that required an awful lot of patience. But there you see, you are trying to um, find about out about the lives of people in the past and if you don't understand their context it's meaningless so all you all you end up with is a string of names and dates yeah right what what makes it become interesting then is to learn about you know the process of industrialization and what brought people into the cities uh, the kind of work they did the interrelationships between the classes and so forth you know. so that kind of fascination translates very easily into Tolkien and the thing that really set me off and this was in uh, uh, late 1997, and I've been wor working on my text database that was meant to support this mega Elvish dictionary uh, already by that time for a year and a half or something. Um, and got really distracted by doing database design, which is not my forte at all. <laughs> but I happened to be nerding around in the first couple of volumes of the History of Middle Earth, the Book of Lost Tales, which is what Tolkien uh, wrote as a young man, it was the, uh, the prototype of the Silmarillion and he wrote it during the First World War. So I was looking at this and at the same time I was reading a couple of books of modern fiction set in the First World War, uh, great books, um, uh, Birdsong by Sebastian Falks and um, Regeneration by Pat Barker which deals with the very famous encounter between the war poets Wilfred Owen and Siegfried Sassoon um, in a psychiatric hospital where they were both being treated for shell shock or supposed shell shock. So on the one hand I was reading this stuff about these people who, who were very famous for their contribution to the canon of English literature and reading about their response to this bitterly disenchanting war 
and their response was bitterly disenchanted. Um, and on the other hand, I was reading this stuff by Tolkien that was full of enchantment. Um, so I wanted to know why, and that basically captured my interest and, and meant that the database work went out the window. I've never gone back to it, thank goodness. Um, <coughs> the, the information is still there for me to mine, you know, um, but I don't think it's the best way to, for me to present these things. I'm a writer, not an engineer, you know. Um, and that led directly to um, Tolkien and the Great War, right. which pursues his life during the First World War and step by step looks at the invention of his legendarium within that context, within the context of the international events, and also in particular the context of his close friendships. Um, so in the forward to the second edition of The Lord of the Rings, when he's uh, telling people that they're, they're, um, they shouldn't be seeing Lord of the Rings as an allegory of the Second World War, he says, uh, I paraphrase slightly, it's often forgotten um, <clears throat> that um, uh, to be caught in 1914 by the shadow of war was equally oppressive as 1939. Um, and then he says, by 1918, all but one of my close friends were dead. Um, so he had three close friends, and, and two of them were killed in the Battle of the Somme, in which Tolkien also fought. Um, and I suppose the heart, to me, of um, Tolkien and the Great War, the, the, the beating heart, uh, is, is their story, the story of these four, four friends, which, which um, is told very eloquently in their own letters, which I was able to read in the Bodleian Library, thanks to the kindness of the Tolkien estate. Oh. Go on. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I'll take a sip of tea. Yeah, perfect. I'm just uh, a little overwhelmed by all the amazing content, but also we've got a bunch of questions coming in, so I think we'll sort of back up and take the questions and then sure. tiptoe up towards your more recent work. Um, first of all, we've got some just audience appreciation of people who are resonating with what you've said so far about the language nerdery. Kay Ben Avraham says, as a fellow nerd who had sheaves of meticulously handwritten pages of Elvish vocabulary in her school backpack, she appreciates very much the fact that you were learning to type by typing up this Elvish vocabulary. That's great. Um, and I was thinking when you were talking about the databases that we have several people here in the audience today who are experts in data analysis and text mining and so forth. So if you've set that project aside, Maybe there are some who want to take it up. Um, and Jeremy Morgan asks whether you see any newer technologies that could be helpful in textual analysis. Is there anything that has your eye right now, technologically speaking? And I'll broaden it out and say, what do you think about digital humanities and the way the directions that text mining and digital humanities are going? Well, you probably know more about that than I do, frankly, Serena. Um, so <laughs> Just barely starting to learn myself. It's certainly exceptionally useful to be able to extract data from raw texts and, and, and to make use that to, to make comparisons between texts. So um, uh, this very day I have been going through every text that I can find in the, in the very early stages that lists uh, names for the Valar, for the gods, and I've created a big table. Uh, with, with the different texts on one side and the names of the Valar along the other side and presented the, the different forms their names take. And this is a way that I'm using to um, um, make certain that, that I am understanding the, the order in which the texts were created and also it tells the story just a glancing at this information in tabular form. Yeah. Um, of the creation of that particular aspect of Tolkien's mythology. Um, it's a very dry and you might think extremely dull process, you know, taking taking these beautiful names out of their beautiful context and sticking them in a table. Um, but actually, because I see it again in the context of, of a creative life, the life of a creative genius in the middle of this astonishing um, conflagration of the First World War, 
um, it's 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 extremely rich. Yeah. Well, right, that part of the process is dry, the collecting and tabulating the data. But once you start to see it, oh, it's super exciting. Once you see patterns and chronologies and uh, interrelationships and networks and so forth. Yeah, very good. Um, OK, Kate has a specific question about your reading history. And then I'll ask another one after that that will bring us right back to where you are in, in your work. Kate wants to know, at what point did you read The Hobbit? Did you read it before Lord of the Rings or after? And how did the one impact your reception of the other? Uh, I read it afterwards. Ooh. And I have to say that I was really quite disappointed as a, as a I suppose, 10-year-old. Perhaps, perhaps, I, perhaps I waited even longer. Uh, I may have been 11 when I first read it. Um, because it wasn't the Lord of the Rings. I, I just wanted more. Um, and it was, clearly, I should have read them in the other order. Um, <laughs> It just didn't have the the the, the detail, um, the verisimilitude. Um, so, but I, you know, I've I've grown more and more fond of the Hobbit over the years. But it, it, you know, it still it still won't knock Lord of the Rings off the top spot for me. And then, of course, the other thing that came along was the Silmarillion. Um, so I, I I was actually uh, of the generation that knew that the Silmarillion. Would one day be published, or hoped it would one day be published. Um, I read *The Lord of the Rings* in 1975, which was two years before it came out, um, and that was quite a surprise when I read that as well, um, yeah. because it was heavy, it was heavy going for a 12-year-old. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Um, so Emily asks then, a few minutes ago you said you'll leave something as a teaser about certain dates. Is that a teaser for your new book? And so why don't oh, you absolutely. talk to us about your new book just as far as you can, just to get us interested so we all want to buy it. So um, Tolkien's Mirror uh, takes its title um, from the Mirror of Galadriel. Um, and It's meant to it, capture all kinds of um, connotations about what, what mirrors can do and what Tolkien's own description of the mirror of Galadriel is like. Um, so, so what I want it to do is to uh, undermine the idea that the relationship between a work of fiction and reality is just a direct one-to-one uh, -one correspondence. That's the kind of thing that Tolkien um, objected to when he talked about uh, critics and readers who misinterpreted the Lord of the Rings as an allegory of the Second World War, where uh, Sauron might be Stalin or Hitler, for example, and Saruman the other one, presumably. You know, um, he found that sort of thing very reductive. Um, <clears throat> Galadriel's mirror is really is a rich um, analogy to use for this because. When you look in it, you don't know if the thing has happened, if it's if it's going to happen, if it's happening right now. Um, when Frodo looks in it and he he sees a wizard figure walking along a road, he wonders whether it's Gandalf or Saruman. Um, he knows that Gandalf appears to be dead, so it can't be him. But you know, um, so there's the question of identity comes up a lot. What I'm doing in Tolkien's Mirror, anyway, is to go back to the beginning of the creation of the Legendarium, because it turns out I've got more to say about that, even in the First World War years. Okay. Uh, my aim is to pursue it all the way to the completion of The Lord of the Rings. Now, that's a very big project. Um, so I'm diving in at various points of key interest, rather than um, trying to present a uh, a month by month account. Um, so I'm showing it as a series of transformations. Um, so there'll be a chapter, for example, um, surrounding the 1931 conversation with uh, C.S. Lewis, in which Tolkien um, and Hugo Dyson um, persuaded Lewis to accept um, that the Christian myth is the true myth, is the truth. Um, and there, I'm trying to look at 
aspects of what Tolkien was doing that suggest to me that he himself was undergoing some kind of spiritual renewal, that his legendarium was getting a fresh impetus from his faith, um, which had all, always been there, of course, but uh, I think he was looking at things in a new way. Um, and then, of course, there's the Hobbit, the introduction of Hobbits. So here we have the collision between um, two largely independent strands of Tolkien's creativity, his mythology that he'd been building since 1914, and the stories he'd been writing for his children since they'd come along. Mm. Um, and the arrival of Hobbits into the Legendarium really uh, changed things enormously. And my argument has always been since, the, since Tolkien and the Great War that inventing Hobbits, essentially to provide his children with someone with whom they could easily identify, rather than, say, an elf or a dwarf. You know, here was someone who was much like an English person of their father's generation, say. Um, that almost accidentally allowed Tolkien to draw very, very closely on his own experience of ar arrival at experience, and that was mm. the First World War. Um, so I think there are some tremendously wise things in The Hobbit about how you deal with responsibility, how you learn responsibility, how you deal with fear. Um, Bilbo in the tunnel um, uh, on the way down to uh, Smaug's lair, um, palpitating with fear, but still going on. You know, I think Tolkien's talking from experience here, though. Of course, he never met a live dragon, as far as we know. Um, and then there's another, a, a third chapter in that, that series of kind of revolutions in the, in the, in the, the middle era of Tolkien's Legendarium um, is, is Numenor. Right. Um, the Tolkien's Atlantis myth, um, which again is very closely related to his friendship with C.S. Lewis. Um, so here, here is a, a date discovery that I will share with you. Um, I, and I'll, I'll, I'll share my method a bit. And my method is simply to read everything there is that's, that, that Tolkien wrote about something and then try and learn as much as I can about the context of, of, of those statements. So I went through his published letters and these have been published since I think 1981. Um, so they've been out there an awful long time. And I looked at everything that he said about Numenor uh, and its invention. And he often talks about the great wave nightmare that he'd had for as long as he could remember. Um, a terrifying thing in which this wave comes over the green fields, swallowing them up, um, and catches him. And he wakes up on the point of drowning. Yeah. Um, but he also said that Numenor came out of a blurb that he wrote for The Hobbit in which he talked about the period between the elder days and the dominion of men. So I dived across the room to um, a very useful and unfortunately somewhat rare book, um, the J.R.R. Tolkien Bibliography by uh, Wayne Hammond um, with the assistance of Doug Anderson. And in there, there's a, a great deal of stuff about the publication of The Hobbit, um, which is now in... Hang on. Well, more accessible uh, volumes. This is the second edition of the... Um, J.R. Tolkien Companion and Guide just come out, um, a really essential research resource. But in, in there, but also in this bibliography, there, there is an account of the correspondence um, that led up to the publication of The Hobbit, and that included the date that Tolkien was asked to write something for publicity purposes, the date he delivered, his he posted his letter, with that piece of writing in it. Um, and there's only a four, four or five day gap between the two. 
So I think, I think the letter was sent to him on the 3rd of December 1936, and he replied on the 8th. Um, now, the story of Numenor has always been tied to um, the idea that it came out of a wager, a bet, an agreement that he had with Lewis to write science fiction. Right, the Quintas. So, Tolkien's story goes that Lewis came in and said, there's far too little of what we like in books, so we'll have to write our own. Why don't, uh, why don't we write science fiction? They were both quite into it. And it was a new form at that time, as a, as a, as a successful, popular uh, genre. Yeah. Um, of course, there were, there were precedents, but it was really starting to, to, to thrive in a, in a new way. Um, and they wanted ways of they wanted ways of getting a public, because uh, neither of them had a real public. Um, the Hobbit was not yet published. On the strength of that pact, Lewis wrote the first of a trilogy, uh, his space trilogy, a book called Out of the Silent Planet. And it was known that he finished writing that in September 1937. So just logically, it was therefore assumed that um, the pact must have been made in the past year or two. Um, and that was about as close as the uh, estimates came mm -hmm. to determining the invention of Numenor. I got it down to five day period, four or five days, um, at least as a, as a very start point. Now it may be that, you know, it was a few more days after that, but I think if Tolkien 20 years later could remember that Numenor came out of that blurb, uh, I think that the, uh, it, there must have been a relatively immediate um, process going on. Um, now the beauty of this is not simply that I've now got a date on a piece of paper, uh, and it, it goes back to what I was saying about studying my Victorian ancestors and, and having to learn about their, um, the, the context of their lives. Tolkien wrote the Hobbit blurb and therefore, it seems, invented Numenor right in the middle of the British royal abdication crisis mm. Mm -hmm. when um, King Edward um, was suddenly revealed to be in love with um, a woman twice divorced, um, which was totally uh, unacceptable to the British constitution, uh, to the law. Um, <clears throat> and there were major shenanigans at the end of which he stepped down because he uh, refused to give up um, uh, Wallace Simpson, his, 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 his lover. Um, he gave up the crown instead. Now, one aspect of this of interest to Tolkien is that Tolkien was a Catholic and Catholics don't believe in divorce. Um, but it was at that time a phenomenal upheaval for Britain um, an undermining of institution that was still regarded as sacred um, and it also happened at a time in a year the end of a year of absolute disaster internationally mm. so the first world war had ended um, in 1918 and in 1919, the, the Treaty of Versailles had been set up. And then after that, the League of Nations and the, the Versailles and the League of Nations had become two kind of pillars upon which the peace rested after that. 1936 uh, saw uh, Hitler um, reclaiming for Germany, parts of Germany that had been taken off it um, or, or rather demilitarized the Rhineland had been demilitarized as part of the Treaty of Versailles so that France would feel not threatened by Germany anymore Hitler rolled into it with his troops in 1936 um, uh, Italy under Mussolini was in Ethiopia using um, <coughs> uh, 
artillery and machine guns and gas against much uh, less uh, well-armed people, to say the least. Um, Japan was in China. And the Spanish Civil War was raging. And that, that was something that was very uh, disturbing to Tolkien, the Spanish Civil War, because his guardian, Father Francis Morgan, uh, remember Tolkien was, was orphaned um, uh, at the age of 12, and taken under the wing of a Catholic priest, family friend. He was uh, Anglo-Spanish. And of course, the Spanish Civil War also revolved very much on the issues of, of, of Catholicism and atheism. Um, so it, it was something that deeply disturbed Tolkien. <coughs> so are these then... And there we have. Suddenly, just by establishing this single date, or near date, um, a whole set of contexts uh, which start to make sense of the story of Numenor, the story of um, an island of peace and bliss which botches everything because of malign influences and because of the weakness of rulers. Um, and uh, where, I think I think Tolkien invented this before this famous pact with Lewis. That's unprovable. What directly followed from the pact with Lewis, though, uh, was Tolkien's time travel story, The Lost Road, unfortunately never finished, which has some really extraordinary passages in it, um, in which the armaments of Numenor, this land in, 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 in Middle-earth, are described in that very uh, archaic style of language that he gave his uh, speakers in, in, in what he wrote in those days. As modern armaments, the ships are made of steel. They cut through water faster than the wind. They have missiles that will go through, uh, travel leagues, um, <clears throat> and so on and so forth. And then at the same time, what, what has happened to Numenor is that this this figure, Sauron, has um, been taken captive, but has managed to gain the king's ear and has poured poison in it um, and perverted the king um, to uh, a complete misunderstanding of uh, the way the world should be um, and turned Numenor into what we could call a police state where people are being uh, dragged away at night, never to return. There are torture chambers. People don't know who they can talk openly to because they might be denounced. You know, these are really contemporary issues. This is the stuff of 1984, you know, um, which hadn't yet been written. <laughs> Okay. Okay. This is so important, and this this chain of reasoning is is so essential that I want to make sure I, I got all the steps of the way. And I think I maybe yeah. missed a couple little links in the chain, and maybe the rest of the audience can help me out with asking more intelligent questions that I'm about to ask. Because <laughs> um, I have sort of big ones about reading the context, but specific ones about the date too. So let's go back to the specific ones about the date first, because I think yeah. I just missed. Missed a step there. Um, oh, I may have missed a step. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're you're so much closer to the material too. Um, it's probably yeah. very obvious to you. Yeah, I miss. So, what's the connection between Numenor and the Hobbit blurb? First of all, so it's simply that Tolkien said uh, that the idea of Numenor came out of the Hobbit blurb, in which he talked about the age between the Elder Days and the Dominion of Men. Now, the Hobbit blurb. He says this in a letter. Actually, he uses okay. this phrase, uh, the, ages, the period between the ages of fairy and the dominion of men. Gotcha, okay. gotcha. And the, that, um, letter is the, that letter is December 3rd, or the blurb was December 3rd? The blurb was somewhere between the 3rd and the 8th of December. Very good, very good. And then just to make sure I got the connection with the talk with Lewis, so they have this coin toss and they agree Lewis is going to write space travel and Tolkien is going to write time travel. Um, so obviously The Lost Road is his attempt to integrate time travel with the Numenor story. But yeah. you think that he had already invented Numenor before they have the, the coin toss? I believe that's 
likely. Okay. Um, and it, it, it would be it would be tough to go through the evidence for that without I, I think I'll save that for my book. Um, but uh, there's there's I think I, I think in all likelihood Tolkien had this legend of Numenor written the first draft at least. Um, and Lewis's proposal um, allowed him to right. say to himself, hey, I can use this. It's new. I'm passionately interested in it. Um, and Lewis's uh, Jack's idea is a good one. Let's 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 try and reach new audience by turning this into a piece of of, of science fiction. Um, but but what he does, what he brings into the Lost Road, into that piece of science fiction, is also really fascinating in terms of its modern characters because they are about the most autobiographical, most obviously autobiographical yeah. things that Tolkien ever wrote. Um. Now this question, I'm going to just blatantly commit the intentional fallacy, um, but does it seem like maybe he was trying too hard to force it to be a time travel story and he was trying to layer Numenor plus the modern characters and time travel and dreams and there were sort of too many things going on and they wouldn't cohere and maybe that's one reason for it being unfinished. Um, you, well you might say that and I think that's been said very often. Um, I, I think actually the reason it wasn't finished was a very practical one which is that um, when he was in the middle of it The Hobbit was published to a fanfare right. and his publisher desperately wanted more about Hobbits. Tolkien fought against that. He tried yeah. every, through everything else he had that wasn't about Hobbits um, <laughs> at, at uh, Stanley Unwin, uh, the, the, his publisher. Um, uh, and Stanley Unwin wouldn't have any of it. So finally Tolkien gave in. Um, and he had then to meld, it wasn't a less challenging thing than what you've just been talking about. He then had to meld The Hobbit uh, against the background of the Silmarillion because they were yeah. really quite semi-detached at best. Yeah. Um, and he desperately wanted again to weave Numenor into it. So that's where we get Gondor and Arnor and Aragorn from. You know, that's that, that, that was how that thread came out. It was an immensely slow process. Um, if you look at those, um, all the typescripts and manuscripts that went into getting Tolkien from the beginning of The Lord of the Rings um, through to uh, Moria, it's mm -hmm. immense. And he rewrote it and um, came up with, with completely divergent plot lines. Um, characters got different names, characters got merged together. Uh, Aragorn was a, started out as a hobbit called Trotter with clogs uh, on his feet because he'd been tortured. Um, uh, uh, not an heir of the kings of Numenor at all. Um, I think if The Hobbit had not been published, but by some magic there was a publisher who was absolutely desperate for The Lost Road, I think, I think Tolkien would have achieved something with that. that that would have been worth reading. Uh, it might well have been quite different from what's what, the fragment that that we act, that actually survives, because he would have gone over it again and again and revised it. And you know, he was a consummate performer, Tolkien. And this is, I think, um, exceptionally clear with the the writing of Lord of the Rings. Um, he wasn't going to be satisfied with um, giving a a duff performance, you know. He had right. to get it right. Now one more little detail about the date. Kate Neville reminds us that December 1936 is right after the Beowulf lecture. So oh, how did that right. fit in? Absolutely. Yeah, so well spotted, uh, Kate. Yeah, the, um, so, so Tolkien was on a high at this point, um, in, in, creatively and academically. He had given a, this landmark lecture um, and, and got something off his off his desk as well, you know. Uh, he had some freedom, um, so he could ride that uplift. Um, he'd also just signed the deal to publish The Hobbit, so finally he felt that there was a purpose. I mean, you, you, you've got to imagine that by this time, 1936, Tolkien had been grinding away at this story writing um, since, uh, what, 1916? Oh. 1970. 
Okay, so 20 years, which would produce absolutely nothing that was published apart from a few poems here and there. Um, and all of a sudden he had a publication deal. So, you know, you can imagine what, what kind of uh, drive that gave to his, his, um, his creativity and what value it gave to his self-worth at last, vindicated, you know. Uh, does that answer the question? I, I, it does, yeah, how that, how that fits in. All right, so now coming back to the larger... There's a, there's a connect... One more thing. Oh, yeah. Sure. <laughs> there, there are connections between the Beowulf lecture and Numenor. Um, yeah. Which I'll go into. I'll leave it at that. Okay, very good. All right, so then I want to come back to the big historical context things as well. So you painted this picture of what's going on in the world at the time, the abdication crisis, the rumblings of war on the horizon, um, all these terrible things going on. Is that then, um, not to push the allegory too far, is that what Tolkien is drowning in? Um, is Numenor temporarily a retreat from all of that? Or he already has the destruction of Numenor in mind from the very beginning because of his Atlantis nightmares. So it's always going to be a, a failure. It's always going to be a destruction and a drowning. Am I right? And is this are you saying this is coming from his historical context? I'm saying that Tolkien attached a nightmare that uh, had no names, no geography, mm -hmm. um, no detail beyond this vast wave, to a story. And that story was planted in his legendarium from the from 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 its beginnings. I mean, he he actually he came up with it when he realised that um, a bit of the Elvish language Quenya that he'd been tinkering with um, suddenly created uh, a name Atalante, a word Atalante meaning downfallen, um, <laughs> and that just meshed so beautifully with the the classical name Atlantis uh, that there was. Uh, a myth demanding to be written, um, into which he could bring his 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 own personal great weight nightmare. And he said that in the process of writing it, he exorcised that nightmare and didn't have it again. Mm, right, that's beautiful. So, where does Luthien fit into all of this? You have that poster, <laughs> the likeness of Luthien. <laughs> Beautiful poster made by the Spanish Tolkien Society to publicise the talk that I gave there uh, this good. year. Um, and you said that Luthien is not only a character but also a, a name for England. And um, Kate Neville, who is here, wrote her master's thesis on the chronology of Luthien, on the evolution of of that name and what it meant throughout the writing. Well, then, um, so how does, she's how does Luthien fit into this? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, if you want to share, feel free to type it up. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, in a, in a nutshell, the, 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 the plain facts of the matter are there in the history of Middle-earth. Um, uh, Luthien was not first used for uh, the, the character Tinuviel. She, she was invented in 1917, but Luthien, the name, uh, didn't come along for a, a little while uh, longer um, and was first applied um, to a, a, a male figure. And then... Um, for a while after that to England or Britain itself. Um, and I, I'm pursuing the, the question of the, you know, the relationship, um, the motivation behind this, um, and I think getting to the core of um, the story of how Tolkien tried to keep England at the heart of his mythology. Um, and he did it in various evolving ways throughout his life um, until, of course, most famously, he turned the Shire into a version of England. But Luthien certainly predates that. Mm -hmm. Very good. So how is this, how is Tolkien's uh, use of Luthien as a name for England similar to or different from what other English writers and poets were doing with their various names for and personifications of England. I mean, Blake is one that springs to mind, obviously, as someone who's trying to write this huge sort of British mythology. How, how is Tolkien similar to or different from a figure like Blake? Oh, gosh. Um, not, a, not a fair question. A, but... <laughs> thank you for that. <laughs> um, well, like a 
a, it feels like a Viva now all of a sudden. <laughs> Tolkien's approach was primarily uh, using what he called feigned history. Right. So he liked to create a, a, a narrative, a rich, believable, complex narrative, um, which had a set of names with a certain flavor. And those were primarily his uh, invented elvish names, of which Luthien was one. Blake was a visionary um, who uh, does seem to have seen visions. Um, he, he believed that he met the ghost of Napoleon on his staircase in London once. Um, <laughs> and then Nelson sit in a tree uh, and give him some advice. <laughs> um, they're just, there's, there's certainly an overlap. I mean, I, I would call Tolkien a visionary in a, in a, in a slightly looser sense than that. Um, and I do think actually that, that some of Tolkien's creative impulses, particularly ones where he couldn't, understand where it was all coming from, um, probably weren't that far uh, distance from um, the, the creative drive of someone like Blake. Mm -hmm. um, but with, with Luthien, it's just really fascinating the way Tolkien just, the, this, this name itself becomes totemic and he wants to use it for various things that mean a lot to him. Um, that's the simplest way of putting it. Uh, and what those things are, I'll, um, well, let me say, all right, so, so one of them, the, the, the first, the male figure, um, uh, I believe was meant to be one of Tolkien's sons. Oh. So he gives the name Luthien first to his son, and if you like, an avatar of his son, a, a figure in Middle Earth who's not meant to be a coded version of his son, but um, is meant to be part of a family that kind of uh, provides a, a way of mythologizing mm -hmm. Tolkien's own life, uh, a way of, of, if you, another way of putting it, maybe putting his signature into the, in, inside the legendarium. Right. Um, re-enchanting mundane life by by having these figures in there that, that somehow relate to, to his own family. Um, so uh, yeah, Luthien is, is one of the sons of the, uh, the figure Ariel, um, who in the Book of Lost Tales, the prototype of the Silmarillion, is a mariner, a Germanic mariner from the, the Dark Ages who arrives uh, at the Lonely Isle of the Elves and hears the stories, the histories of the elves. Um, and Ariel pretty clearly is a kind of avatar of Tolkien. Tolkien is the mediator for us. Um, he, he's the author, he invents a character who um, gives a sense that these, these stories are not invented, but, but actually um, uh, directly passed down to us. Yeah. Well, I'm going to ask a question now for something that I'm fascinated in that sort of picks up all these threads and goes back to where we started. And we're coming close to the end of our time, so if anybody else in the audience has more questions, please send them in now. So here's my question. I'm going to ramble a little bit until I get to the actual question. Um, you've talked an awful lot about Tolkien's historical context. He was a, a soldier, and he was vividly aware of these things that were going on in his own country and around Europe and around the world. And he was definitely talking to his times. And I think you've shown that powerfully in your two books so far and in the one that's forthcoming as well. But you said at the beginning that he's not on the syllabi in the English schools and he's not considered respectable like T.S. Eliot, Ezra Pound, Virginia Woolf, you know, he's not a modernist. Well, I've been doing a little bit of work recently looking at Tolkien and the others, Lewis, Williams, and Barfield, as modernists and seeing how intimately they were engaged in all the conversations of their day and how yeah. intimately aware they were of what all the other high modernist writers were working on and how they knew most of them personally, wrote letters to them, reviewed their books, hung out with them and so forth. Um, so in what way is Tolkien not a modernist or is he? And we just need to redefine our terms a little bit. Oh, another huge question. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Summarise proof. Um, <laughs> uh, well, I, I, I suppose I would contest what you're saying very slightly in the sense that, yes, Williams knew a hell of a lot of the modernists. 
Um, but but at the point I've just been talking about, the Numenor period, Tolkien didn't know Williams. And uh, or, or, um, let me think about this. Or only just, right? Um, uh, so 30, so that, that aspect of the... Yeah, sorry. they wouldn't have met in person yet, but Lewis would have been talking to Tolkien about Williams at that stage. I think that I think I think Tolkien may have met him by then, but but that's yes, it's not not proven. Um, Williams came up to Oxford to meet Lewis and one other Dom, but we yeah, don't know whether that was Tolkien or Neville Coggle. Between yeah. Lewis and Williams uh -huh. are March of thirty six, yeah. But at any rate, um, I, I think yes. Yeah, so so Williams would be the one with the real connection uh, with with the modernists. Um, but no, the Inklings were even before he arrived very literate, very widely read. Um, they may have been. Uh, they may have had something of an animus against quite a lot of modernism um, and, and probably quite a lot of war, First World War writing too. Um, but they were certainly, um, if, if you have an animus against something, it doesn't mean you, that you ignore it. Actually, right. you're probably quite averse, you know. Uh, you talk about it more, right? Yep. Um, so it's easier actually i think to talk about tolkien as a postmodernist than a modernist um, because of all the extraordinarily complex textual things he does um but uh, i'm sure we don't have time for that either really <laughs> all right well i just wanted to say though you mentioned my two books and i don't think we've actually mentioned the other one which no we haven't um, which is this at thing Exeter college tolkien 2014 right he's a kind of uh, codicil to um uh, Tolkien in the Great War, uh, in which, for various practical reasons, I somewhat neglect his college life, um, but there it all is as well. Okay, excellent. Well, we did have a couple of questions come in, but I'm afraid that each one is a 10 to 15 minute question, <laughs> no. at, at least. Um, but you know, feel free to continue these discussions, you know, online and so forth. And I'm sure we'll have other chances to to talk with you in the near future. Do you know when the new book will be released? No, no idea yet. All right, do we know even next year? Um, I don't have a publisher. Okay. As yet. <clears throat> All right, well, that's, maybe we can help you get on that. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Well, we, we really enjoyed talking with you. This is absolutely delightful. So many important subjects that I and many people here really care about. And we look forward to hearing you talk at MythMoot. Uh, do you know what your talk will be on at MythMoot? I'm going to be talking about how uh, and why Tolkien wrote um, the, the Bombadil country sequence. So the old forest, the house of Tom Bombadil and the uh, fog on the Barrow Downs. Um, and again, it's a, it's a fascinating um, story, which which has bearings on his uh, his First World War experiences, among other things. Brilliant. And I've promised not to ask you if you think Tom Bombadil will make an appearance in the Amazon series. So um, I will not ask you that. <laughs> I promise not to talk about those adaptations. Um, well, thank you very much, John. This was really enjoyable that you've got so much good work out there already with your books and your articles online. And we really look forward to the new book, hopefully before too long. Yeah, me too. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, come back and talk to us soon. All right, oh, thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everybody. If you enjoyed this seminar, please consider making a small donation to Signum University. Your gift will help us continue to make the seminar series and other great content available for free to the public. Just go to signumuniversity.org slash fund slash donate slash seminars. Thanks.